take Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Charismatic, passionate, and just 20 years old when the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood first formed, he set out to be both a poet and a painter. His father was a political refugee from um, the Italian Risorgimento, um, who was exiled from Italy, um, pursued by the authorities. And so as a child, Rossetti is sitting on the floor drawing, whilst you know, the old men are talking about political revolution all around him. And as an artist, therefore, you know, he had an idea of the artist as rebel, Rossetti embraced a new style of painting, using intense colours to depict scenes from an imagined medieval golden age. It earned him popular and material success. This is Chelsea. These days a byword for blingy oligarchs but it gained a reputation for being rather bohemian after Rossetti made his home here, at Tudor House in Cheney Walk. He filled the house with a menagerie of creatures, which included several peacocks, a kangaroo, and a wombat called Top. His great dream was to acquire a young elephant that he would train to clean the windows. Perhaps it was difficult to hang on to a human cleaner, what with all the peacocks. He told a friend that he dreamed of a man passing the house, seeing the elephant cleaning the windows and saying, who lives in that house? And being told, why, it's the painter Rossetti, to which the person would naturally say, I should like to buy one of his pictures. Which is quite interesting because it suggests he wasn't completely away with the fairies. He had figured out that unorthodox living might have a certain commercial value. Quite apart from the menagerie, Rossetti shared his home with a bunch of arty, unorthodox lodgers. There were rumours about the poet Algernon Swinburne and the painter Simeon Solomon sliding naked down the banisters. Again, you simply wouldn't want to be the cleaner. There were tales of Rossetti angrily hurling a cup of scalding tea in the face of the writer George Meredith, about impromptu parties, all night drinking, nocturnal poetry readings and Rossetti's addiction to the powerful sedative chloral hydrate and all of it commemorated by a wholesome water fountain. Nineteenth-century Bohemia was generally a blokey world, but the women in the pre-Raphaelite circle also started challenging convention. They carried the medieval theme into their dress, designing loose, untailored clothes to allow freedom of movement. It's a style not a million miles from the one fashion magazines still like to call bohemian, which also takes some inspiration from the old association with the gypsies. That would have been a very big step at that particular time. You're thinking in the 1850s you had the crinoline, then you had stays and corsets, which put women in a particular shape. So if you actually abandoned that, then you have this straight shape or this slight S-bend, -S that would have seen to be sort of loose, unrestricted, and maybe people associated looseness of dress, looseness of hair, with looseness of morals. Rossetti and his friends didn't just adopt the outward trappings of a bohemian life. They chose to live very differently from your average straight-laced family values Victorian. This house belonged to Rossetti's great friends, the poet and designer William Morris, and his wife Janie. They commissioned and created it as a monument to medievalism, inviting Rossetti and their other mates to help them decorate. In a sense, the artists were sort of hermetically sealing themselves off from society, living in these medievals of fantasy mansions or pa palaces. And the idea was it's in, in, separated in this way and protected. You could actually indulge your interests and your fantasies, and your art can become your life. The two were synonymous. And that's what I think made them bohemian. In that they didn't actually distinguish between the professional life, you know, the artistic life, and the, the personal life. In fact, their artistic and personal lives merged on the very walls of the house. Here's William and Janie Morris as medieval king and queen. And here, a little tribute to Rossetti's beloved pet, a royal wombat. 
They're shown as a close and unified couple. It was a bit more complicated than that in reality, thanks in part to their friend Rossetti. There were a lot of women in Rossetti's life. A few particularly loomed large. There was Lizzie Siddle, an artist and model with whom he had a long, tortuous affair. But after they finally married, she committed suicide. Simultaneously, he was having an affair with the prostitute Fanny Cornforth. Rossetti made her his housekeeper, giving the lie to the old expression a woman should be a housekeeper in the kitchen and a prostitute in the bedroom. Fanny Cornforth, like me, was the other way round. Then there was his friend's wife, Janie Morris. And it was here in the Red House that they fell in love. Rossetti didn't exactly hide his passion. He painted Janie over and over and bombarded her with poetry. But in a way, what was really curious about the relationship and what most people would probably say was truly bohemian wasn't so much the affair per se, but William Morris's attitude towards it. He didn't get angry, he didn't try to stop it. In fact, he sort of tried to help it. He co-rented a house with Rossetti, then conveniently went travelling so that Rossetti and Janie could be alone together. And then he came up with a whole new set of sexual politics, which he outlined in a letter to a friend. This is his description of how a liberated marriage would be. The couple would be free. Being free, if unfortunately distaste arose between them, they should make no pretense of its not having arisen. But I should hope that in most cases, friendship would go along with desire and would outlive it, and the couple would still remain together, but always as free people. In other words, if a married couple stop fancying each other, they shouldn't pretend that hasn't happened. And as friends, they should be able to stay together while they have affairs. Being a very principled person, he felt if his wife wanted to explore free love and have relationships with other men, then maybe, who was he to, who was he to stop her? He wanted her to find fulfilment on her own terms. He didn't want to come down like the pater familias and say, thou shalt not embark on an adulterous relationship. He was open-minded, and that was part of him being a sort of radical, free thinker. It is quite a radical idea. I mean, if people live like that even now and put the idea forward, people are a bit shocked. But I find it slightly pitiful. If he'd published that letter and then his wife had had an affair, you'd think, OK, that's someone living out their manifesto. Coming up with that set of sexual politics after your wife has an affair slightly smacks of trying to justify it, trying to put an artistic or political context onto something awful. But in a way, I hope that he was upset about it, because I don't really see it as that bohemian to be delighted if your partner has an affair, or bourgeois to care. I think to, to, to not care is a bit cold and English and passionless, and the true gypsy would be tortured by their spouse having an affair and would have them and their lover killed. I say that in case my husband's watching. But certainly the idea of a certain sexual libertinism is key to our idea of what a bohemian is now, and it may date back to the strange set of affairs between these people. Not everyone was as open-minded as William Morris. As Rossetti's paintings and poems became markedly more sensual, he and his circle came under attack in the press for immorality. In 1871, rival poet Robert Buchanan castigated the group for indulging fleshliness as the supreme aim of art. He denounced Rossetti's works as a morbid deviation from healthy forms of life. All the gross and vulgar conceptions of life which are formulated into certain products of art, literature and criticism emanate from this bohemian class. So there we have someone identifying Rossetti and his circle as bohemians, but it's fully negative. There's no nuance, there's no, they're interesting, they're attractive, but we're not sure. These bohemians, he says, are awful. He goes on to say, there lies the seat of the cancer there in the bohemian fringe of society, spreading daily like all cancerous diseases, foul in itself and creating foulness. Really strong language. He's not just saying, well, that's not my kind of art, not how I'd live really angry and frightened. And I think that's a, a sign that these bohemians were properly threatening to the conventional voices of society. Rossetti might have wanted his work to cause a stir, but he was devastated by the charge of depravity, 
feeling his serious artistic endeavours had been reduced to sensuality and juvenile rebellion. Rossetti suffered a nervous breakdown. His relationship with Janie Morris ended, he sank further into drink and drug addiction and really withdrew from society altogether. So you might think, well, there you go, that was the end of bohemianism, the vision is obviously a terrible one. Actually, no, that, of course, is not the end of the story because people still talk about bohemians today, they still find it a romantic notion, and that's part of it. The misery and the gloom and the bad end, that's just being a tortured bohemian artist.